Welcome to Keep What You Earn, your judgment and jargon-free zone for entrepreneurs of all levels. Get ready to learn how to scale your business, save money in taxes, and create a business that grows your wealth. If it feels like the financial side of business is like eating your vegetables, well then think of this podcast as the ranch dressing to make the process a little more enjoyable. My name is Shannon Weinstein. I'm a CPA and business owner on a mission to simplify money and empower others through knowledge. I hope this episode inspires you to take action, but remember that the information we share is for educational purposes only and is not individual tax advice. Now that we got that out of the way, let's start the show. So much like a big tax bill, we don't normally worry about things like cybersecurity until they become a problem in our lives and we actually feel the tangible pain associated with decisions that we make on how we protect ourselves. So that's why I'm really excited for you to listen to today's episode with Kathy Zant. She is an internationally recognized speaker on security, marketing, and data-driven website development. She's spoken at countless events worldwide, both online and on stage. And she's been an organizer for both World Camp Phoenix twice and World Camp USA. Now, she's also a frequent guest on numerous podcasts about WordPress and emerging technologies. And she's the co-host of the Cadence Beat, Do the Woo, WP Motivate, and is a frequent co-host on This Week in WordPress. She's an executive producer of Open, the open source documentary about the WordPress community. And she's passionate about your stories and believes that everyone's voice deserves to be heard. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is cybersecurity, how to protect your passwords, how to make sure you're sharing your information safely online. And there's a ton in here for digital entrepreneurs in terms of how to protect your information and prevent incidents from happening to you. And down to the micro behaviors, down to the little things, she's going to tell you some stories about incidents that have happened that I personally find to be unbelievable, but they happen. So let's dive in and hear from Kathy. Hey, Kathy, welcome to Keep What You Earn. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course, I'm happy to have you. So can you just tell everyone who you are? Yeah, so I'm Kathy Zant. I have been a web developer and I've been a hacker, white hat hacker, but I got thrown into the, into security like super young. I, I was a web developer, really excited about what the internet was going to do. I was like, this is going to be a big, huge thing. And so I got a job as an internet developer and inherited a server from someone else who didn't secure it and it got hacked. And so the company I was working for sent me to security school and I learned how to hack even more because in order to understand what hackers are doing, you have to like kind of be a bit of a hacker. And so I've just kind of like baked security into everything that I've done. And I had an opportunity about seven years ago to clean up hacked WordPress sites. And I I estimated I've cleaned up about two to 3,000 WordPress sites that have gotten hacked. And through that experience... I learned a lot and working with smaller businesses that were using WordPress and understanding sort of their security mindset, I think we can do better. And so I'm here to talk about that. I love it. And th- and this is something so important, especially as we enter into like the new age with like AI and the new capabilities technology is gaining. We also have to keep up with keeping ourselves safe. I mean, remember when, remember back in the day, when back in the day when you had like AOL and you would open your browser and then it'd be like a bajillion pop-ups and everybody would click these little links because they'd be so convincing that you were gonna, you know, download now. <laughs> and, and you would you'd fall victim to these things. And I feel like now it feels so silly, like we know so much better now, but that's because we had to go through it. We had to go through the effects of it and we had to actually feel the burden of like identity theft that wasn't protected by your credit card company, or that wasn't something you could recover from. Like, it was a rough time where we got really adjusted into this idea of cybersecurity. Right. Well, I, you know, everybody, everybody who's aware of cybersecurity is aware for it for one reason. They've had an incident. They've had something happen to them, whether their WordPress site got hacked into or their bank account, or they inherited a server that was not set up properly like I did. But everybody gets into security, not because, oh my gosh, security is so exciting, but because you know the fear of God has been put into them because they had an incident like that happen. Like nobody wants to talk about like home security or insurance unless like the neighbors got broken into, right? And it's the same type of thing with, with cybersecurity. Nobody wants to know about any of this stuff until they hear the story or it happens, unfortunately, to them. And so I'm here to tell some stories. I'm here to yeah. to really 
I, I just think, you know, small businesses, especially um, AT&T did some research and they found that that small businesses that didn't have a security posture and did have a hack, like 60 percent of them, it like the, the, the stress of it, the financial duress that they went through, 60 percent of them closed down because of that. And so wow. if we can start shifting that so that smaller businesses start thinking like some of these larger businesses, I think we can we can protect ourselves a little bit better. So when I saw the name of your podcast and we were kind of in the same same little group, I was like, keep what you earn. Yeah. Put up some barriers so that you can keep it safe. Yeah, I call it the financial fortress. It's all yeah. the, the the legal, the security, and like the tax strategy that has to be wrapped around your business so that you can actually keep it and you can actually hang on to it. Otherwise, it's it's there for the taking, whether it be a hacker, the IRS, anything. Like you have to make sure that you're you're keeping it. And what's interesting is no matter what type of infrastructure, I want to go and start with this. No matter what type of in infrastructure we have and all the tech and all the tools and all the gates and whatever, and the McAfee, <laughs> right? No matter the protection we have or feel we have, our behavior right. to me is what really drives everything is who are you opening the door for? What are you actually doing? Let's talk about that for a second. How can entrepreneurs be more vigilant or how can they help prevent these types of hacking incidents and in, in their control? Yeah, it's really important because you can have all of the tools. You can have the, the entirety of every single security tool out there. But if you don't know how to use it, it's all just, you know, screwdrivers and hammers in the toolbox and nothing's getting used. If you don't know, you know, that a hammer gets used for this and a screwdriver gets used for that, if you don't know what a firewall is and you don't know what multi-factor authentication is, and those are just words to you, then you can't make good security decisions. So it's really important to have some level of just understanding and education. And then I think one thing that's really important for, for everyone to do in terms of like a security mindset is to act as if it's going to happen. Act as if you are going to get hacked. And what are you going to do about it when it happens? Not if, but when. Like what kind of, we call it in security, an incident response plan. What kind of, who needs to know? What are the stakeholders? Who needs to be informed? What types of people would be impacted if like you have an e-commerce site and all of your customers' information is exposed somehow? What rules with PCI, the, the payment card industry, has a number of rules associated with credit card information and personally identifiable information? That's all your customers and their email address and their, even their IP address is considered identifiable information. What are you going to do if that gets exposed? What's the plan? Because I'll tell you what, when, when these types of incidences happen, and I've seen thousands of them, Everybody freaks out just a little bit. Even if you've been through it a hundred times, it's still very disconcerting when something gets exposed. And when people are under stress, what happens to their ability to think? Womp, it goes right down to like, I can only do this one thing. So if you have a plan that you've devised when you do have all of your mental faculties, when you can think through things, when you have a security expert coming along and saying, okay, you're going to need to do this and you're going to need to do this. And, you know, this type of disclosure needs to happen to your customers and all of the legal rules associated with, with these kinds of breaches. If you have all of that in place before something like this happens, then you're going to be prepared for it. And it's also going to help you make better security decisions to prevent that from happening. So going through some sort of incident response planning and assume it's going to happen someday just puts you in the mindset of really fortifying your defenses. I agree. And it's just so important to not only have the tools at your fingertips, know how to use them, but also have that plan in place. And what were some examples, Kathy? Let's say somebody's brand new to this and they're like, I would love to have an incident response plan, but like, where the hell do I start? Like, what should I, what should be part of that plan? Yeah. Well, I think having first an audit of all of your systems. And that goes from everything to from your website to your accounting software to all of the computers on your network, all of the cell phones that are accessing your network, your social media accounts. 
I just heard a story recently of somebody who got fished out of, they had a very, very high profile Instagram account. I think they had, you know, six figures in terms of followers. They were, they were working the Instagram and they wanted to get that, you know, the blue check mark on their Instagram. And so they applied for it. Just almost serendipitously, a phishing email comes in saying, if you would like to get this, you need to fill out this form if you want to get verified on Instagram. And they asked for their password in that form. And the person didn't didn't notice that that URL wasn't, you know, part of Meta, wasn't part of Instagram. And they filled out the form and they lost their Instagram account. And that was really devastating to them because they had worked so hard at building up that audience and a lot of their leads were coming in through Instagram. And so they had to go through all of this rigor mole to get that account back. Very, very stressful. And what happens when somebody's stressed out like that and they're trying to get their account back? How much time are they spending on sending out emails to customers? Everything is dedicated towards getting this asset back. Because even your social yeah, media... It's crisis. It's crisis response. Yeah. It is a crisis response. So having an audit of all of the things that you have that are important to your business, and then also going through all of the different things that... All of the... How are you, how are you storing your passwords? That is something that's like incredibly important. And a lot of people... You know, you remember back in the, back in the AOL days, we yeah. had the ability to have... I have a single password for everything, my password. And I think the psychology of passwords has been something that's really interesting because everybody wants something that's like super unique to them. Nobody's going to guess this. Nobody's going to understand this in my zip code or my pet's name in my zip code or my kid's birthdays or my kid's names all put together with a couple numbers at the end with a dollar sign, you know, something. And, we, it, and it's so unique and it feels so unique, but so many of these passwords, once you reuse them, let's say, for example, you, you go shopping and you're, you're on some very small shoe site. And you, this is the only place you can get these really cool shoes. And that proprietor of that e-commerce site is not guarding their information. But you set up an account there and that password that you use everywhere is now on that site and a hacker gets it. There are all of these breached password databases that kind of get shared around. There's some on GitHub, which is a programming site where people share source code and things like that. And there's databases of passwords. And so what hackers end up doing is getting these databases of passwords, tying them into a script and just like brute forcing into sites. Well, if you're using just one password for yourself and that's your password everywhere, it's in a breach. It's I'm going to bet it's in a breach. If you've been on the internet for any length of time and you've been using, reusing passwords, that, that can be a big problem. So understanding all of your assets and how you are interfacing with them is kind of your first step towards putting together an incident response plan. And as you go through that and doing sort of an audit of everything that is a touch point Having some just basic security, like how are we storing our passwords? How are we, if we, you have an organization and you're sharing passwords, like everybody's logging into Instagram to post something, how do those passwords get shared? How even some, there's one story I heard about a company that was doing YouTube videos and they had a number of different people who were accessing that YouTube or that, that Google account. And so it does multi-factor, like will pop up alerts on people's phones and say, you know, somebody from this location is trying to log in. And mm-hmm. one person just said, yeah, that's somebody I'm sure they're getting. And their their YouTube account got, got hacked. So having an understanding of all of the different assets you have, how you authenticate to those, and then putting together like sort of that incident response plan is going to uncover all of the various things that you need to do in order pr- to protect them. So making yeah. a list, checking it twice. So for me, right, what goes through my mind is, okay, well, where am I sharing my information? Where am I, What? where do I have a key, right? Like my password is a key into this data or where am I putting my data on the internet? But also, especially for my career, because I do tax returns, Yeah, that is a huge risk. They're going to go after social security numbers, EIN numbers, all the stuff, bank account information that I have for my clients. Are you kidding me? 
We have to be so secure. We are bound by regulatory standards on how well we keep our cybersecurity. This is why, if you're a client of mine, this is why I'm anal retentive about our portal. <laughs> this is why. Because if you're emailing me stuff with your social on it, I don't want I don't want that to happen because I don't want to be at risk of you. Like if we if you get hacked, your email gets hacked, my email gets hacked, anyone who's on CC's email gets hacked, they have the access to that information. I think we're really, we're pretty liberal these days about what we share on the internet because I think we assume there are certain protections in place or assume we're somehow immune from this stuff. But like, it can happen to anyone. It happened to my husband several times. He's had his credit card hacked. He's had all this stuff at no fault of his. He is a very, we'll say, well-behaved business owner when it comes to cybersecurity. But you can't control the businesses that you interact with. You can't control, like you give your credit card to Wayfair. I'm not, by the way, random business. I just chose out of my, you know what? But like you give your credit card to them. You don't know right. if that's going to be part of a, a breach or anything like that. You just have to be, you have to protect your own stuff as though yeah. at any point it's, it, it could fall victim to it. Exactly. It, just like that mindset of acting as if it's going to happen. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's going to happen. So how can you make things difficult for for hackers should they get this kind of information you know and, and even and I tell people all the time you know you you can't remember these passwords go for 16 characters these days I remember when it was just 10 the good old days yeah. <laughs> for when it was just the one password but now you have to use a password manager because your passwords are all going to be complex and they're going to be unique for every individual site if you're doing things right if you're Passwords are just kind of broken the way the system is right now. And there are some technologies coming that are, are going to help us deal with that. But right now, it's you have to use a password manager. You have to use two-factor authentication. And unfortunately, like Verizon does this annual survey on breaches, and they found that like 28% of people actually use two-factor authentication. So people don't... And I get it. It's just like this other thing that makes things super hard. But if it makes it hard for you, it also makes it hard for hackers. And, and passwords are just so broken. <laughs> They're just so broken. But like, making sure that using a password manager, using things that are, are long and complex, doing things like that, it, it helps. But that comes from that security mindset of it's going to happen to me. So what can I do to make things just hard and complex so so hackers go someplace else? What do you think are the minimum viable things? Like the minimum things to have in place, right? Like yeah. think about your home security system, right? It's like, well, what do I need? Do I need the ADT system? Do I need the cameras? Do I need the whatever? What is the the digital equivalent of sort of if nothing else, you need to have you mentioned a password manager? Yeah. And let's talk about like, are there softwares and other things that you need to have to make sure that you're protected? Yeah. Password manager is very important. I, I don't know how anybody can live without them right now, but I know that people do. If you are sharing accounts and you need to share a password, all of these password managers have the capabilities of sending someone access to that password that expires after some time. So it's, you don't want to copy paste passwords into emails. Or even, you know, like Slack or Teams or anything like that. Don't put passwords elsewhere. Keep them in an encrypted place. So I would always use a password manager. Two-factor authentication, I would use an app on your phone. There's Google Authenticator. There's a lot of, actually, this one company out of Cyprus that does iOS and app development for Android they found that there were a lot of rogue 2FA apps in both the App Store and Google Play Store. So make sure you're using something like Google's Authenticator app, and it gives you like a six-digit code that rotates every 30 seconds. That's the 2FA that you want to be able to use. If you have backup codes, store those in your password manager as well. Make sure your password manager is like locked down. I really recommend 1Password just because it it has all of the bells and whistles, but it is more expensive if you're looking for something incredibly inexpensive. Bitwarden is an open source, which means its source code gets reviewed by all kinds of security-minded people and security researchers. Um, Bitwarden is, is great. You can store your two-factor authentication codes in one password. So if you want everything all in one place, or if you have something that 
like you have your Instagram account and lots of people are logging in, your whole team is logging in, but you want it secured by 2FA, you can put the 2FA code in into the one password record for Instagram and then put that in a vault that your team members can access. So then nobody's like having to call each other and, and get that two-factor code. It makes things a lot easier. You have to live with a password manager right now. It's That's just like bare minimum because of of the ways so many breaches that that's been the problem is like there's been so many different breaches where passwords have been exposed and there's a website called have i been pwned it's like owned but with a p and you can go on that site and put in your email address and see if your email has ever been exposed in a breach you can even test your passwords and see if one of your passwords is exposed in a breach. So if you have that one password that you're using everywhere, you can go there and see if it's in one of these breach databases. Huh. Yeah. Didn't so that's that. that's a great resource. It's put out by a guy in Australia named Troy Hunt, and he's been a security researcher forever. And there's tons of good information there. I highly recommend that people go sign up on there. You can put in your email address and say, notify me if I've ever been in a breach. And so, you is know. It, is I'll, it free? Yeah, it's free. It's free. Guys, what's the name of the site again? I'm definitely have, gonna do this. Have I been pwned? Pwned. Yeah. With I haven't P. heard that in like a decade or two. Oh my God. Wow. That's yeah, how, it's a that's great how old resource. it might be. Yeah. <laughs> but his his he's actually got an API to that database of breached passwords. So if you're using like one password, they actually have something called, I think it's called Watchtower, where mm. if your password ends up in Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned database, database, it'll say, hey, look, you need to change this password because it's been in a breach. Because because if it's been in a breach, it's in one of those password databases. And that just means hackers have that as an option to brute force you. So, And also another reason why not to use one single password. I know one password is the name of the platform, but to not use one single, which is so funny to say, to not use one single password for all your stuff because if that one gets compromised, you have an entire day of going in and changing all your passwords. Yes. It's good because then you know, okay, if they got into one thing, they got into one thing and yeah. it's isolated and you can actually address it. Yeah. 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 Without that, without causing Super further helpful. damage. So Kathy, you mentioned you have stories. I want some stories. What, what have you seen in your work, I know you worked with a lot of WordPress accounts and things like that and online business owners, which is super relevant for this audience. Yeah. Talk to me. What have you seen happen? Lessons learned, like some impactful things that could have been potentially prevented or avoided using cybersecurity? Yeah. The the worst thing that I see is people who say, it can't happen to me. Mm-hmm. Why would anybody want to hack into my website? It's just a cat blog. I actually have I actually have a a blog called Sally's Cat Blog. It's just a test site or a demo site that I set up the domain and set up the site just because I heard all the time, it's just a cat blog. It's just my personal blog. Nobody wants to get into it. But the thing is, hackers will get into anything. And the thing is, is like, there. it's not like a APT, like this hacking group, like, you know, Mossad is going after all of these things or the CIA. It's not like that level hacker that's going to try to get into any of your small business accounts. It's not this big, scary CSI type of event. These are kids in their mom's basement writing scripts. You know, it's not like, you know, some kid in their mom's basement, like trying to hack into Sally's cat blog, but he's written a script with Python or whatever, and he's playing around and seeing what can happen. So I've seen tons of sites get hacked because people are just not making good security decisions because they're not paying attention to things because they don't think that they're important enough. But if you look at those scripts that they target, let's say, 1,000 WordPress sites and they're going after one particular vulnerability or they're going after brute force attacks, if they can get into 100 sites, then they can take those hundred sites and use the resources on those servers and put more hacking on that and go after other things. And so they have these like command and control centers. So every single website, every single bank account, every single social media account, every single email account is valuable because they can use it for further hacking. They can use it to go after other things. They can use it in aggregate to really do some damage towards 
something that they're really trying to target. So they're really not necessarily after your blog. They're after your resources. So every single thing that you have that has any kind of authentication to it is has authentication because it's somewhere on that security spectrum where you want it protected. You don't want somebody into your credit card, your money, your cryptocurrency accounts, those types of things. One story, now this didn't happen to me, but it's something that I've read about that was just like so frightening. I want to share this story because it goes towards understanding how two-factor authentication using SMS can be can be exploited. So this guy, uh, for those, sorry, for those listening, text message, right? Text messages. Yes. So okay. remember, you know, some of, some things will just send you a, like, here's your six digit code to get into something. And right. A, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this is some coming over, coming over a text message. So there's this guy, he was really into cryptocurrency at his Coinbase account. It was secured with SMS, two-factor authentication. And he's going to bed at night and he's got his phone, he's looking at it and he's like, ah, it's not hitting the cell network. I wonder what's going on, but I'll check it in the morning. And so he didn't do anything when he first noticed that his cell phone could not access the cellular towers. The next morning he woke up $100,000 poorer. Scary. So what happened is a hacker spear targeted him and went to his cell phone provider, pretended to be him and said, you know, my phone's not working. I don't know what's going on. All this other, like my mom died, whatever, whatever stressors that he could put on that cell phone provider and got his SIM card swapped. So his cell phone number was now going to the hacker's cell phone. He got into the guy's Gmail account that way. And with the Gmail account, he was able to get into the Coinbase account. And by the time he woke up, he it, it, there's this, I, I will send you, Shannon, so you can put this in the show notes, but he wrote this up all in this, in this post. And just reading it, you understand the psychology of how a hack happens and how something that seems so innocuous as my cell phone can't reach the cell tower, I wonder what's going on. Oh, well, I'll solve it tomorrow is your first indication that maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> Wait, maybe you should take action. If something just doesn't seem right, it could be the first indication that something very wrong is happening. Never so. would have connected the dots on, like, I would never expect someone to connect the dots on that and be like, I'm at a security risk. It's never that obvious that that's what's right. happening. It's like the very subtle little things that aren't going the same way. I mentioned this before we hit record, but so in Costa Rica, we were robbed. Yeah. And we should have known. So here's what's funny. We were robbed twice in the same day. Wow. Here's, but here's, here's my version of that, right? And, and this is the funny thing. Like we don't notice. The first time they came while we were at dinner and the cleaning people had come that day, but I wasn't really paying attention. I was walking around, working, whatever. And somehow between when we got back, like when we went to dinner and got back from dinner, a box of our towels had moved to the table outside on the patio. Like the beach towels had moved from one side of the patio to the other. And I was like, oh, that must have been someone who was here, who was cleaning. They moved them, whatever. And like Jason thought nothing of it. I thought nothing of it. And then we came back again or we then we went to bed and we woke up and we looked outside and we were like, I was like, why are all my weights on the floor? Why? What? It was like piece after piece after piece figuring out oh my God, we were robbed last night. And they took a box, a yoga mat, our box of towels. Like everyone was safe. Everything was fine. Mm -hmm. But they took like, it was a very petty crime, but it was like, oh my God. And they hit us twice because like we saw the camera and we were like, oh my God, while we were at dinner, they took everything down from the, they took it out of the, the kitchen outside and they put it on the table so they could come and grab it later. Wow. And then I was like, oh my God. And I said, we felt like idiots because we were like, they literally left a sign that they were here. Yeah. <laughs> and th for me, it's the same thing. It's the innocuous like, oh my, that's where my cell can't connect. Because we're all used to hiccups. We're all right. used to things that are unexpected. We're all used to explaining away and justifying the unusual. Yeah. And we yeah. do that a lot. And I think that it's not to say don't do that because then you're going to be paranoid. But like, there's a balance there, right? It, there's a bit of like, sometimes there's healthy paranoia of like, this is weird. I should just, just to be sure, I should call or I should 
like use my my husband wife's phone and call the cell phone company and find out why this is happening right now right um it, or just is it just happening to me you know that that's yeah, another like, question that's that you weird can, why is yeah. it happening to me and not you it's kind of right. going through this like yeah decision tree of should i be worried about this yes or no yeah <laughs> yeah 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 and you know, it's so interesting it, it's it's just another reason why you know security professionals tell you it, like used to if 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 a service only offers SMS based two FA two factor authentication, still use it. It's still going to protect you from a password that gets guessed or a password that's in a breach that you know was somebody else's password, but it's in a breach and so it's in that database, right? So still right. use two factor authentication, but if it's only SMS. But this is why security professionals will try to move people over to using that authenticator based two factor authentication something on your phone or that time based thing that's going every 30 seconds and giving you a new six digit code because those types of things can't uh, sms is you're just you're at the mercy of whoever's at the AT&T store and is is socially engineered or conned into changing a, it's sms it's behavior it's psychology yes, it's, it's like all you have psychology. to yeah it's all psychology is what's holding you back from being secure. It's not like you can have every tool on the planet, but if they can call and convince the Verizon person right. that they're you, that's terrifying that somebody would ever want to do that and be and target that type of thing. But those people are out there. It's very real. Yeah. Yeah. And social engineering, I mean, that's a, a whole sort of realm of of hacks that happen phishing so those emails that you know your paypal account has been locked and all of your funds are going away unless you take oh action God. every and day i get one of those every all the single time. day yeah and and ha they use all kinds of clever things the ones that i'm seeing now are google forms like i'm getting all these google google form emails like you know fill out this form to get access to this thing that you need and so, so they're doing things like that. And so the, the forms are kind of bypassing sort of Google's spam filters and a lot of the security controls that they have. But social engineering, if they can get through the controls, if they can get through, gosh, there was one recently, it was a hosting provider and they had their email list got hacked, their email service provider got hacked. And so all of these like DHL things were going out. And I'm like, wait a minute, why is this coming from this hosting provider? This is weird. And it was a DHL, you know, your package has been, there's a lot of those types yeah, of things. Yeah, this happened to my husband. There was, I think it's pretty public now, but Rackspace got hacked and it yeah. was a huge, so he was victim to that and then lost his email for his business for like a whole week and was like, that's my business. Like, I, like I can't get emails from customers. I can't get, I'm like, he goes, this ain't like, Auntie Sue's email account where the kids share pictures. This is like the entire business had their email shut down for a whole yeah. week. You know, that's huge. That's impactful. It is. And there's this whole this whole idea of like supply chain attacks. Like if they can get into Apple or th if they could get into any kind of software provider and those and get some piece of code into an update and you go update, let's say pick an app, Canva, and Canva gets hacked and some bit of code can get put into their source code and you update your software. These kinds of things are, are pretty rare and there's some security controls, but it's really important as small businesses to understand that that kind of thing can happen and to be, make sure that you just never assume if something's out of the ordinary and doesn't feel right, to give yourself sort of that buffer between stimulus and response to take a step back and say, does this feel right? Does this, where does this fit within my intuitive gut vibe? Because I think a lot of times we're just like so busy. We don't pay attention to that. Even when something's like, and they feed off of that. They know that they know it. That's yes. Why business owners are targets. Cause they're like, they, we get bombarded with need this, need this, need this. And we're just trying to get it all done. Right that we don't think about what we're actually doing and that's where they bite you. Right. And one tactic that really gets used a lot is sort of this time pressure because when you feel that time pressure, it causes stress and causes that, you know, ability to think and to really intuit what's going on. You, you just time pressure. Oh my gosh, this thing is happening if I don't take action now. But that's one of the first signs that something's wrong is if somebody's putting undue time pressure on you to make a decision before you're ready. 
it can always wait. Everything can always yeah. wait. You can just t- take a step back, gut check yourself. Is this, does this feel right? Does this seem right? Let me check and see if this is happening with anybody else. Start asking questions and then things will really make sense. I, one person that I know, they were, they were buying a house and they were at the point where they're transferring escrow money and they started the actual, and these are, this was somebody in the security space too, and they actually started an escrow transfer of funds to a hacker's account because they got socially engineered and tricked. Somebody got information that this, this is transfer was imminent and was going to happen, whether it was the title company that got ha- something, somebody got hacked, got wind of this going to happen. And at the last minute, they got a phishing email that told them that they needed to transfer the money elsewhere. But they were able to gut check. They started the transfer and they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. And they called the, the company and said, you know, did you send this? no, tell us more. And they immediately said, we'll call you right back. Stopped it with their bank just because they they took a moment to ask a question, to verify something. Is this real? Yeah. Uh, I did so. the same thing. Whenever my clients give me access to their, like they'll set up a username and password for me for their accounts. But like, I never know when that's going to come. So like a client will send me a, like, log into your new account here. And I'll be like, hey, oh, because I sold you the banana phone, right? <laughs> hey, So it's like, hey, did you send me a login for this thing? They're like, yeah. Okay, cool. Like, it's always worth that quick check because there's no harm in checking to make sure it was them, but there is harm in not checking sometimes. And it's really important to know. Now that goes into another thing I was going to ask you. Let's talk about really quick as we wrap this up, social sharing, because you just said they knew this transaction was imminent and you know how that can often happen is when you're oversharing or you're telling a lot about what's going on in your life on social media, in emails and whatever. I'm not saying you have to be reserved, quiet and not share what's going on, but I think we all need to do a really good job of being careful, like where we are, what we're doing, the credit card charges, because for example, you see someone's posting that they're traveling internationally, right? Now it's like, ah, okay. So now their credit card company won't care if I run the card here because they think they're traveling or whatever it is. Like you got to be really careful about what you're sharing and what you're sharing about what you're doing so that you can be vigilant too while you're there. Right. Right. And those multi-factor questions, you know, what was the first concert you ever went to? I always put like numbers after it's like, okay. Those Facebook posts. Have you seen them? Yes. Yes. People. Oh my God. Oh my God. You guys, have you guys seen these, the Facebook posts that are like, Tell us your first pet's name in the comments and people do it. I'm like, y'all, they are trying to collect your passwords of your security yeah. answers. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's so, it's becoming more obvious now, but I see so many people fall victim to it. Yes, very much so. Yeah. And you don't know, like if you're, like it's your local radio station asking these questions, you don't know, that's all very public. You don't know who's reading those. Basically, even if it's locked down, even if it's a private group, you don't know everyone that could be in that group today or in six months. So just assume that, you know, hackers are everywhere and, and don't share things. And then the other thing is if, if you have to, if a, if a service, why is banking the worst? Banking with two-factor authentication, they're like always behind. Come yes. on, banking, let's get up with, with the plan. But they, they're the worst, like... It's my mortgage company still asking what concert I went to, my, my pet's first name, who was my best friend, like those types of things. Like if you're going to put that in there and you're going to use your actual people that you may have answered a question on social media at one time, choose like a set of numbers and put that at the end of it. Use your password manager and make a note of what you're doing. So then at least you have it in a password manager. But yeah, just assume anything you put on social media is visible by hackers. Yeah. And also the, what's now happening more is the, like, so for example, IRS has ID me, right? Yeah. And they're doing facial scans. This is kind of freaky, at least for me, like this is new technology. They're doing it at airports now. The last time I flew down to Costa Rica, I just had to walk in front of a scanner, no boarding pass. And they were like, welcome Shannon, 23B, go sit down. And I was like, holy crap. And now the IRS Albeit they're receiving everything via fax, but they have this technology, right? They don't have emails yet, 
<laughs> but they have facial recognition through your webcam to let you into your account. Now, one, that's awesome. But, you know, it's also like, well, could someone put a picture of me like this? I have no idea. Like they could hit, put a picture of me in front of the webcam. I don't know. So you have to be super careful because even with facial recognition, that's something that can be manipulated with yeah. AI and other things. Like there's a whole lot of uncharted territory coming our way with all this. Yes, definitely. Definitely. There was one story that I recently heard about people getting so shoulder surfed in public places. That means somebody's looking over your sho shoulder as you're typing in like your iPhone six digit code because your facial recognition didn't work. And then you set your phone down and somebody swipes your phone. Well, that's your entire digital life right there because you probably have face ID set up for your bank account for everything. And all they have to do is change that six digit code. And now they have access to everything and they can go and start swiping accounts. So yeah, there's, there's always like the weakest link in any kind of security posture that you have and just to be aware of what those weakest links are, the scams that are happening. But once you're empowered by that, by knowledge, by understanding and knowing that, you know, you have responsibility over your security and your digital life, it's, it's a lot easier it, just being aware, it, just having some attention and awareness on it. it. It's not that hard to stay secure if you just pay attention and make that assumption that it's going to happen and you can make some good decisions based on on that knowledge that you gather. I agree. Instead of investing in some cool new tool to help protect you, I mean, obviously you can do that, but it's more important to invest in a habit to ask a quick question, to pause and reflect, to, like you said, it's a gap between the, like the response time, the stimulus and the right. response to go, is this real? Apply a filter of some kind before you act. And that will yeah. save you way more than the best antivirus on the planet. If you're, you know, if you're still operating that way, Kathy, thank you so much for sharing all this with us. This is really helpful to think about and to revisit. I would encourage you guys put it on your calendar to do some type of password, you know, review kind of a security audit, like she said, look through your processes. Where are you sharing data? How are you sharing data? And how are you protecting yourself? It's so important. Kathy, how can folks learn more from you and hear more about what you're doing? My website is zant.com, Z-A-N-T. I am putting together a security course for small businesses that should be ready probably maybe by the time this, this is published. So if you go to zant.com, you can find out more about me and if that course is ready. Otherwise, there'll be a wait list that you can find there. But yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Of course. Thank you so much, Kathy, for joining me. If you find yourself surprised by how much you make and how little you actually keep, then your problem probably isn't your profit. It's your cash flow. Cash flow problems are the number one reason small businesses fail because they run out of gas in the tank. And that's why I released a mini course called Endless Cash that helps you quickly forecast your own cash flow using the same template that we use with our clients. If the pressure of launches and big investments stress you out, then grab a copy of Endless Cash and start getting ahead of those road bumps right now. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on your podcast platform. This small action goes a long way for podcasters to get our message heard by more business owners just like you. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to information about our guests and ways to get in touch with me. We'll see you on the next episode.